Okay, we are working on categorizing the post-it notes. But are we ready to get? Yeah, we're gonna get started then. The times on the clocks have no actual basis in reality. Okay, how do I get those slides back? The slide that Carolyn had up in the last, oh, here. Okay. So now the, the fun part of what we've been doing for the last day and a half is like trying to turn the things that we've been talking about into concrete recommendations so that we know what the highest priority areas are to sort of eliminate some of the roadblocks so that we can get to a point where we are able to diagnose people who we're pretty sure have genetic uh, based disorders and we've done the sequencing and we can't find it. Like, what are the things that are really gonna make that process easier? How can we sort of turn the curve so that we can get to that? So we asked you to think about uh, the key roadblocks and really sort of big wild ideas about how we could solve those roadblocks and also reasonable, easy to achieve ideas that we could start with now. Um, and the other things that I also want you to be thinking about, and I'm gonna start calling on people or I'm, we're gonna go through sort of some of the areas. Carolyn is back there <laughs> trying to categorize these into groups. Um, <laughs> right, <laughs> yeah. So, um, so we're gonna start with some of the different sort of broad categories of things that we see there. And I'm gonna ask some of you to, to um, talk about your ideas. The other things that I want you to be thinking about too is like a lot of what I see back there is like, here's the scientific thing that needs to happen, but how do you do that too? Like are the, you know, NHGRI does a lot of like big consortium type stuff that's very tightly coordinated, but we also support a lot of like individual research grants that can be loosely coordinated in some way. And so think about like, what is the scale at which the thing needs to happen? What is the most, the, what kind of approach gives you the best likelihood of, of success? So Carolyn, do you wanna yell out an area? You can borrow a microphone, yes. So broadly, one of the, areas, and there's a, a variety of different things that go under this, but I think it's an interesting theme that emerged, and I'm over here on the short-term reasonable side of the board, is connecting the ba some things that we would typically do in sort of more of a basic science space through a clinical lens. And so there are ideas like, how do we make sure we have incentives, incentives for converting new technologies to clinical tests or how do we have um, mechanisms of support to bring functional validation into, a cl into clinical resources or um, consideration, considering, considering the therapeutic interventions and the therapeutic side, not just the diagnostic discovery side of things. And so that's one theme that a couple of ideas got called out about. And so if anyone, is there anything that people wanna raise or comment on that theme? Yeah, and if you put one of the post-it notes up there, you know, not everybody got a chance to read it. So mm -hmm. I'd encourage people to sort of share what they talked about or what they wrote on their post-it notes here. We don't necessarily know who wrote what post-it note. <laughs> so I wonder about the, the Canadian experiment with micro grants and whether that would be a model to consider. Can you talk a little bit more about, I don't know. Oh, are you talking about, yeah. So both Canada and Japan have um, sort of networks where a researcher or a clinical lab can submit 
a, a variant or a gene that they want followed up on, and they essentially match them with researchers who are studying that gene to functionally validate it. And so then after that match is made, then they'll send the funding to the researcher to do that follow-up. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and so better enabling both the matching part of that and the funding that's needed to do the functional validation. Okay, go ahead, Heidi. But for that specific topic that Carolyn brought up, um, on the therapeutic side, I mean, I think, I mean, hopefully the um, pharma companies are focused on that part of the equation, but one of the things that we've been working with a lot of rare disease groups actually through the CZI Rare is One is a lot of them need to convince pharma that their disease is prevalent enough to work, be worthy of investigation. So we've actually been just doing prevalence calculations using NOMAD and you know validating variants to help them prove the utility or the, the prevalence of their disorder. Um, also, a lot of these clinical trials require natural history studies of rare disease to be done so that you have you know, ways to monitor improvement in phenotype if you're doing a clinical trial. So it comes back to the sort of patient engagement side, the phenotype, the registries, and that sort of thing. And so I think um, perhaps creating, you know, and this might be a partnership with the CZI Rare is one you know, organization, but also open it up to more that NIH might fund to really network with these patient organizations to enable their data to be brought into patient registries to be able to provide sort of common infrastructure and support to these, you know, groups to enable, you know, all of them to mm -hmm. advance and help with the connect connectivity to pharma for drug development. Mm -hmm. So I, I actually, I, I don't know if, um, I think some of our colleagues from NCATS were going to listen to this, and if they aren't on right now, they're probably going to watch it later. But I know that that's um, some of the activities that they're doing there, um, and we have talked about connecting genomics into that sort of space a little bit more, but uh, that's a great point. Any other? I don't know. Ideas that anyone wants to expand upon in that area, or do we want to call on Carolyn to give us a new topic? I can give you all a new topic. And I've now just realized as several people were up here discussing, some people's big ideas are other people's reasonable ideas and vice versa. And then right. sometimes when you categorize, it sort of moves from a reasonable idea into a larger idea. But picking up a little bit on what we just had, there's a, there's a number of things that came about around the patient partnering, partnering with the individuals or with the um, patient adv advocacy groups. But one of the things that's interesting about the theme of these are one is recognizing them as drivers of the research and the ability to help sort of come in. But several different people talked about the need for having the standardization and platforms that can help enable those groups to come in. And so it blends into a whole separate thing we could talk about as standards, but I'm not gonna go there yet and talk now about how do we think about platforms and standardization to facilitate that type of work and engagement with those groups. And I know that there's some activities already happening in that space. I don't, I know no, that's not, but the sort of elevation, I think of that as some of what's captured with some of these ideas. Heidi. So one thing we did in ClinGen, um, when we were investigating why some labs weren't submitting to ClinVar, they made the comment, oh, the commercial software platform that I use doesn't f help me facilitate submission. So we went out and developed a set of standards for genomic software analysis platforms to enable ClinVar you know, sharing. And then we posted that list and we evaluated all the software platforms. They have to apply each year and get on that list. Mm -hmm. So an analogy to that on the patient side, you know, each, each patient organization they all recognize they need like some sort of registry, but they're thinking about different things and not always knowing why they need it and for what purpose and what, and then what 
registry platforms out there are good and support them. So you can imagine an effort simply as here are all the registry platforms that exist. Here are all the attributes they have. Here are ones that we mark as having the, the minimum necessary to support X. And that's kind of how we did it in ClinGen mm -hmm. to support data sharing was our premise. Um, and that would enable a, a, a trusted, reliable source for those organizations to then adopt a patient registry platform that would help facilitate and not miss things like genotype <laughs> like, or mm -hmm. other things. Okay. Melissa. It's been in my head since the question yesterday about phenotypes and what we're collecting with phenotypes. And I think that we often work from what's the characteristics of a patient to what's the underlying genetic cause and then patient groups, uh, rare disease uh, cluster around, these are the mutations I have, right? And and I see that a lot with sex chromosome aneuploidies, right? Association for X and Y syndromes, right? Like I am XXX or XXYY or my, my child. and and. Mm -hmm. I think it would be really cool in thinking about how to connect patient groups. The standardization could also be, how do you connect based on phenotypes? And then that could feed into also how we develop treatments or, or get pharmaceutical companies to think about treatments for a phenotype that might have multiple mutations in different pathways that have all manifested then in similar sets of phenotypes, right? That co-occur together. That might be a another way so you know we can link patients based on rare disease variants and however we define a variant eh, i don't know but 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 also then thinking about how we allow people to connect based on the phenotypes that are affecting their lives right or, and and also and then and then it came up just in discussion this morning the people might have rare mm, mild phenotypes and and maybe even a mutation that's being ameliorated by some other background mutation, but because they're, they've never been asked about that phenotype, yeah. we don't have it. And I think we could expand our power by asking patients across this broad network, well, what else about, what else about this phenotype? Or ugh, words are hard this morning. Do you also have this phenotype, right? So in the same way that 23andMe goes back and asks patients, if we could, or people. So I think sort of more broadly, what we're talking about is like a phenotype first approach to looking for causal variants as well. So part, part of it is like engaging with the individuals to obtain phenotype information, but we're all also getting data and information from a lot of other sources. What are some of the roadblocks in have, getting the phenotype information that is needed to facilitate this and what how could we sort of overcome that so david i see well one thing that i noticed looking through clinvar which i use quite a bit is, is that often there's not phenotype information that's not consistent you can kind of understand why that happens because as we learn most of those submissions come from the laboratory and the laboratory doesn't get information from the clinicians that really allows them to fill those in completely, at least not consistently. So the question is, is there a way to incentivize the person who actually saw the patient or the family even to participate in that process in some way that would uh, enrich in that record? Uh-huh. Allie and then Heidi. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, does it even need to go further where we're talking about in talking to Epic, talking to Cerner, talking to the major EMR, EHR providers and, and having a linkage there. So it's like, as long as you're consented and opt in, you don't have to worry about it. We can do it on the back end. Like, Yeah, I think you bring up a really good point. You know, part of the reason the labs don't get phenotype is it's too much work for the clinician to or write it on the rec form or they do write it, but nobody converts it into an electronic data file. Right. And so the, the downstream beneficial impact, if you had easy export and even an HPO phenotyping system, which a couple of sites, one in Canada and one in the UK, implemented uh, an HPO-based phenotyping system into Epic and integrated, but most places don't have that. But you can imagine, you know, sort of tools that facilitate the transfer of data to clinical labs. And if that data was then there, then they could push it downstream 
in the research realm, or, you know, if that's too pie in the sky, then this notion of funding the clinical labs to actually invest some effort in collecting that information. Um, a lot of the clinical labs do put our Genome Connect patient registry on their clinical labs, and then the patient can sign up, upload their genetic test report, and we put their phenotypes in ClinVar. And so you can sometimes go in, you'll see in ClinVar a no clinical significance, but it's phenotype only, and it's us adding the phenotype on the patient that Lab X had already tested. And uh -huh. so that brings that phenotype. But, you know, we only have 3,000 patients in Genome Connect. It's a drop in the bucket in terms of the massive, like, number of patients out there. So figuring out how to scale approaches like that, I think, are really valuable. Angela. I just want to say this got brought up actually at the Advancing Genomic Medicine um, uh, Research uh, NIH NHGRI workshop that was earlier this year. And there are people definitely sort of thinking about this. How do you use machine learning approaches to call the um, EHR to create these sort of FIWAS type terms, but then bring it back rather than in terms of thinking about this from common variants, but now down to rare variants. Um, so I definitely think that there is, you know, interest amongst other parts of the NIH and NHGRI as well for this. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead, Jay. So another approach um, is, uh, is is potentially regulatory or at least standards of practice um, in this regard. Uh, so the CDC requires physicians to report infections, diseases, attributes of that infection, and so forth. And you have to be compliant with that. So I'm envisioning you're doing a diagnostic for a particular variant or, or disease, and you haven't collected the clinical data. Well, how do you interpret that variant if you don't actually know the patient has the phenotype is always this issue. Right. And there are some labs that don't have probably sufficient phenotypic elements to actually determine whether the person has that condition. So is that good medical practice? And I would ask, I would say it isn't. So perhaps another way to go about this is through the American College of Medical Genetics or other organizations and say, this is the standard of practice. This is what clinical labs should collect. And this would be the appropriate thing to collect. The, 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 I can't, I don't know if there might be a carrot in this whole thing, perhaps some funding provided to get going with this, or to say you get a nice gold star for doing this or three stars or whatever, but the stick would be when misdiagnosis occurs. And that is very potent in the field, particularly for laboratories. So perhaps some discussion um, with, of how to go about this might include how, what the standard of practice is and elevating it so that phenotypic data uh, is, is included as an essential part of what you're doing in a clinical testing lab. So just to, we did write an ACMG guideline on this, you know, a bunch of us wrote it uh, actually in response to discovering that clinicians were not including phenotype because they didn't want to be scooped on publications related to rare. I was crazy. So we were like, okay, so we put, wrote a bunch of guidelines for the labs, for the clinicians, all that. But at the end of the day, you know, it's not happening more because it's it's hard, it's time consuming, the clinicians are overworked with documentation requests. So I think the ultimate thing is the carrot has to be like, make it easy, right? Um, because I just don't think that ACMG guideline really moved yeah, the needle. Yeah. Yeah. Making it easy for a clinical lab to go and extract data from somebody's medical record is potentially problematic. Who is looking at what? And where is the privacy in there? And I mentioned this the other day, HIPAA, right? So HIPAA really does have some pretty clear guidelines as to who can see what, when. And even a physician wants to transfer records of their the individual they're caring for to another physician it has to go through this HIPAA guidelines. So uh, we, we don't want to sort of spoil things by having, for a lot of these labs, freely shareable information. I mean, just imagine your own medical record being shared, right, by a laboratory. Who, who's looking at it? What, what guidelines are they? And are they doing research? And when I consented to research, I didn't actually agree to that part of the research. I agreed to this part relevant to my condition. I didn't agree to the other part. So I have a little concern that if we go too far with this, we might spoil things a bit without firm regulations. And I know you guys attempted to do this. And there's no reason you can't try it again. But I do worry that uh, while we try to get the data sharing up and further and further with the phenotypes, we'll start butting against some of the other issues that have come up and why HIPAA is in place and, and so forth. So it just can be done, but we just need to be do it very fully and carefully. Carolyn, are you moving to another topic? Because there's another hand here. One hand, and then I was going to move, but we can go ahead. 
uh, Beckham, and then we'll go to that. Just one quick point. So, you know, Ontario and Canada, we recently implemented uh, a testing program for genetic epilepsy, Ontario Epilepsy Genetics test, Testing Program. We had a number of parameters to it, including an educational component for the clinicians that are ordering the testing, but also the kind of uh, requisitioning process that had to be adhered to that included a requisition that uh, required physicians to fill in key clinical information for these patients in order to be able to order the tests. So lab, labs essentially the gatekeepers. So if you did not submit the required information, and we were actually by a ministry required to collect this information for a period of two years to ultimately pull together data on you know, health system impact. Are we testing the right patient populations? Are we seeing the right yield? Is, uh, you know, is everything being done the way it's supposed to be done? But in that case, uh, in that case uh, labs acted as gatekeepers. So if you did not fill out the forms that had all of the requirements, you simply did not get a test. Um, and, and so so it was pretty easy to collect all this information because everybody wants a test for their patient. And if you don't submit the required information, you just don't get a test. And that that worked out pretty well, very quickly. The joys of a national health care okay, system. We're going to... We're going to go we'll start on a different topic. So Carolyn's going to bring us to a new area. Yeah, and I was just going to say there are there are several things which I've lumped together, but I think you guys were just talking about this, about guidelines and standards and the, the value that those can do in moving things forward. The next one is one of these things where I was splitting and lumping, and then in the end I lumped <laughs> um, things together. And it has to do with how do we get to having comprehensive functional information about variants? And some people were coming into this from a um, data generation standpoint, you know, measure the effect of every possible variant in every rare disease related gene in at least one assay or um, comprehensive functional sc screening of coding variants for all clinically meaningful genes. And other people were coming into this from a database standpoint. Like how do we have a one-stop shopping place where you can find out what, um, um, sorry. Yeah, so to have information on variants and phenotypes and information in one repository or one place where you can go to understand where, where you should be linking out to, along with ideas of making sure that information is reported irrespective of outcome. And some of the new NIH data sharing policies would hopefully help with that if they're implemented in good ways. And some of my colleagues have been chatting with me about ways that we can try to use the data sharing policy to help with some of the things that have come up in this meeting. Um, but so that's a number of different themes, but I think they all come from, I put them together under this idea of how do we think about comprehensive information about vari variants both at the data existing and the data being findable and usable. Mm -hmm. So does anyone want to expand upon things that they wrote in their post-its in that sort of topic? Go ahead, Doug. I mean, I, I guess I wrote one of those post-its, <laughs> I feel like. It's a pretty obvious thing to do and we should do it. I mean, I... I, I think some of you know uh, others' comments about like, well, will we get the right phenotype with the assays we can scale now? I mean, the answer is no, we won't, but at least we'll learn where we need new assays and you know have a sense of what the scale of that problem is. Um, and I, I just, you know, I, yeah, I guess to me, it seems like a pretty important thing to do relative to the data sharing part. I think that is, a much harder, conceptually harder problem to even know what the right answer is. Um, you know, you mentioned the data sharing policy, and I'd be curious to know what exactly is it that the NIH can do, because that will be a requirement, right? That will be a stick that gets used to make people share their data. And I guess the question I would ask is like, what does minimum viable compliance with that stick look like? Mm -hmm. Because if minimum viable compliance doesn't get us what we want, then it is simply going to be a way to immiserate researchers that will not improve the situation. Right. So like, I think we should be really careful about making sure that minimum viable compliance, not ideal compliance, but minimum viable compliance looks like what we want it, what we want in the end, or else we should do something different. I have a lot of thoughts about the data sharing policies and the way that we can or cannot enforce them and use them as a stick. And I'm 
not going to editorialize on those here, <laughs> but, but, but if you want to talk to me some other time. Um, but yeah, no, that is uh, true. So like, you know, in even in if you think about the genomic data sharing policy, which has been around for a while, the NIH has a policy and a way of implementing it. And then NHGRI has gone sort of above and beyond that base policy and has created a different set of expectations that is much more aggressive than what is expected if you're funded at another institute because we place such a high priority on data sharing. So we, we even if the baseline policy maybe doesn't have the detail or the teeth required to get to where we need to be, there is always the, the chance that we can have other sort of expectations that we would put out. Also, when we create these programs, right, like we, we, can, we make all kinds of different policies that are within a program. So if something is really important to get out, there are ways for us to, to help make sure that that happens. I also think that there's a, there's a responsibility for the, the minimal data sharing viability to work to have clarity on where is that happening, right? So in the very, you know, I think the existence of ClinVar creates some minimal data sharing expectation that you can put and it's, and it has a reasonableness to it because there's an understanding of where it's going and the work that people have done to make that a viable direction to go. Similarly, in the GWAS world, dbGaP was developed in a way that facilitated that type of data sharing, right? And so in where the trouble comes is when you're in these data types that don't have that clear, where does it go? And so to me, some of what's what some of the responsibility we think about sometimes is how do we make how do we help facilitate that collection spot, which can then enable the, the stick part of it to be less of a big stick. Go ahead. I guess just to respond, I do think like one key thing to think about is that the like functional data by its nature is much more heterogeneous right. than either of the other data types that you mentioned. Correct. And probably NHGRI has the most experience in this relative to ENCODE. And I think, and maybe Anshul is still on the call and he can say, or other people in the room can say, but my impression is that a lot of ENCODE-like data got, like uh, from the same assays, got, an, got generated outside of the, the ENCODE consortium, right? Was pretty reasonable data complied with the data sharing standards at the time, which was to deposit raw reads in GEO or SRA, and then basically like didn't get reanalyzed ever because it, it's heterogeneous enough that it's a, it's a basically an N of one effort to go and reanalyze each data set. And right. so whatever gets spun up, whether it's active curation or some really well-crafted repository that, that, you know, then people comply with, it, it just, it's going to be a bigger effort than either of the, of the, or sorry, not bigger, more complicated to get it right effort because functional data is so heterogeneous. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, just sort of thinking about trying to get a lot of that, from my experience in ENCODE, trying to get a lot of that functional data into ENCODE, I think there's two real sort of endpoints. In ENCODE, it's this idea we want to have all the right metadata, everything's organized, we have sort of the matrix of everything, of what it could be, and it all needs to fit into that. And that's really hard when people are still inventing technologies, new types of phenotyping, it's yeah. nearly impossible to get that to be uniform. But that's like for people that want the entire data set to reanalyze it. On the other hand, we just kind of want, there's people who just want, I want this variant, has anyone ever done any experiment everywhere on this one variant? Mm -hmm. Like we just, we don't even have that. Like someone can't type in a variant and say, who's done anything anywhere, I'll go talk to them. And right. that alone seems easier and much more surmountable problem to, to fix first. So uh, another question that I have about this, thinking about getting variant level functional information out in some way that's useful to people is like, what what is like the highest priority need in this community for doing that, if you had to sort of focus your efforts on certain genes or coding regions versus non-coding regions or figuring out how to asset, assess functional impact of structural variants, like what is like the biggest roadblock for you in the work that you're doing? 
How would you prioritize that? It's all a roadblock. The whole thing is roadblock. Go ahead, Heidi. Well, I don't know that it specifically addresses the the actual functional studies part, but to get back to the distribution of that data, um, which I think to enable its use, as you were pointing out, like has, has anybody done anything on this variant? So I think having a database, whether it's Mave, you know, um, sort of databases you guys are working on where all this data is, it has standards for how you structure the information and that was all there, but then that there is a direct API, API based linkage to ClinVar so that when someone goes to ClinVar and looks up that variant, which they all do, then there is an entry with a URL link over to the MAVE database uh -huh. to know that there's something in there. Uh -huh. And all you have to do is put a URL in ClinVar and, you know, with like MAVE entry. <laughs> and then they'll go over there and they'll find it. And or, you know, in this VLM network that we're trying to build, you can also query that network and also based on an API to that database, know that it exists. You know, I think that we're still building that it's nascent. So I think the build the database and have it re URL represented in ClinVar would really solve, what do you think, like a significant barrier? If I can just jump in, we're, we're doing that. So that, so we um, are funded from NHGRI, Andrew and, and Leah Starita and I are, are funded to do, a, a project is funded to do exactly that. So we're talking with ClinVar, we've got a draft of the data model, which the ClinGen folks and ClinVar and us are all kind of working on fi finalizing. But I think within the year, we aspire to have at least the first set of curated MAVE data sets in ClinVar with URLs, yes, but also a few other goodies like some key data quality and, you know, um, uh, um, odds path calculations and other things that people might want to see done. The question about that one is just how do we scale it when there's a thousand data? So right now, there's only 20 or 30 data sets for human genes that are worth paying attention to, maybe data sets. But, you know, I, I think within three to five years, there will be a thousand. And, and, the sort of active curation model that, which is important because if you're going to use the data in the clinic, like somebody needs to look at it and like make sure it's good enough to use and calculate all the features. But anyway, that's happening. It's a great idea. So I'm glad, I'm glad so, you think it's a great idea. I'm just looking at the time. So, cause I'm sure we have a lot of other big theme areas. Let me just see if I can try to like summarize though, what I'm hearing here is like a need to better aggregate the functional uh, information about variants in a way that you can do variant level queries that is integrated into sorts of the other tools where you're already looking like ClinVar, et cetera. Clin okay, great. Okay, Carolyn, do you wanna take us to another topic area? Sure, where to go? Okay, I feel like we haven't talked about data analysis as much. So I'm going to take us into this space and we can, so, well, I'll come. So there's some good ideas that I don't think I'm going to have us talk a lot about right now about sort of generation of multi, more generation of multi-omic resources and just sort of a date like, separate before it was like specific information about a like a variant and this is more broad scale genome wide multiomics but then we get into the software and analysis needs for integrating the multiomics which can also pull into the prediction and bringing in machine learning so there's like just covered a lot but let's stick in the sort of integration and machine learning need space as a topic to dive into a little bit more. Thoughts? Go ahead, Nara. Use your microphone, please. Machine learn, we need the data to, to learn. And I think resources like what Doug and Andrea are putting together have, will be very useful for that. So whatever, is coming 
next to use machine learning to help us to understand better these variants should be use of resources like that. And I was wondering if other people who are generating data, functional data on these variants and genes could also make use of that because then your data is going to be more complete. How do, the, how do you get the word out? Or how do you expand what you're doing to allow people to submit data to you also from specific projects? And that all will help because then it's in one place and machine learning can go to that one place and learn about it and, and use that to generate hypotheses for us. Andrew. Yeah. I guess, you know, going back to the first session, you know, there's a lot of excitement and interest regarding multi-omic data, regarding sort of integrating this within the pan genome context, you name it. I think this is all lovely. We have potentially some of the individual tools, but integrating all this stuff together is completely outside of the wheelhouse of any tool that actually exists right now, right. let alone visualizing it. Like a lot of sort of the stuff which we were, would hope to do, especially within the pangeum context, if you know if this really ends up being you know where the field is heading for from rare disease perspectives, you just can't visualize you know, chromatin, transcriptomic, you know, all the sort of multi-omic level data right. within that context with current tools. So I think there's a huge need for that if we are wanting to head in this direction. Deanne. We definitely need the infrastructure to put this data in, in either distributed where people can find it. So uh -huh. some way of like addressing where all this data is so that machine learning can go find it like Nara was saying. Yep. Or actually also, um, there are structures that exist now that could integrate the multi-omics data, but there needs to be information from the experimenters that allow you to integrate it. Mm -hmm. I think that's something that Angel talked about yesterday, which was, you know, the data is sometimes a mess. Mm -hmm. So it would be nice to actually have people have a, a better uh, bar for annotation on these experiments when they're funded. So yeah. one question I have is, um, so in order to develop and use tools for multiomic data integration in the context of rare disease, we need multiomic data. And where is that being generated? Is there a need for generating that data in some sort of comprehensive way? Because I mean, we talked about how difficult it is even to get long read sequencing in, the, in a clinical setting. I'm guessing that there's not necessarily a lot beyond that either. What, what is the need for data generation here versus aggregating data from sources that already exist? So I'm going to go with Deanne first and then Becca. And so then just a corollary to that, have your experimental people work with the informatics people from the beginning, or your AI people coupled with your experimental people, because then, then a lot of these things could be addressed except post hoc. As a biomedician say, it's not the right time to bring us in at the end of the experiment. Yeah, you know, so it's so bringing them bringing a consortium in with that purpose in mind, with all this multi omics data generation, with ideas of diseases in mind, and then people who have domain expertise and all of the available data that's out there, and can add to that with their clinical colleagues mm -hmm. and their in their in their experimental colleagues would be a good picture to do, address that. Okay, Beckham, and then uh, Andrew. Yeah, so I, I think I'm to on Andrew. oh, I'm sorry, Anshul. I no, no, go ahead, go ahead. I just, I, I'm, okay, just, okay, we're going to go. Come, Andrew Anshul. So it, as we're discussing this kind of data integration and, and uh, you know, how best to integrate these data, I was trying to think, of, you know, if, if there is a model where that actually works, and the only really good example I can think of is language learning models like ChatGPT, where uh, data is not all sitting in one place. It's essentially all over the place. The, the key difference though is that data is readily accessible, right? Um, and, and these you know, language learning models ultimately assemble these data into kind of functionally integrated units that we can use. Um, um, so, so would that model work for uh, you know, integrated genomics data, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and the only real difference that I can think about is like the substantial one is the access to data, right? Um, that that would prevent in that direction. So, Uh, so, <laughs> oh, already it's only lunchtime. So sorry. So I don't know that it's a reasonable strategy to envision, you know, uh, you know, some sort of a utopian space where all the data flows into this one giant data repository and it's perfect. 
and we have machine learning models that are assembling it into functional units that we can use. The reality is, is we're going to have to figure out our best ways to develop tools to tap into data sources. Um, and of course, in human healthcare, uh, there is regulatory that you have to navigate. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be, and it's not going to be quick. Uh -huh. um, and and uh, and and you know, I th I think that is that's the path rather than the other way around. And you know, and we know it works, and it can work because the data sources that Chat GPT uses, for example, are not perfect either. Right. 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 Okay. Uh, Andrew, is your comment related to this, or can I kind of? Would not be surprised if Anshul's isn't on the same line. Let Anshul go first. Anshul, why don't you go first? Okay, um, just uh, two quick thoughts. So one is I think uh, what would be interesting is sort of like a, almost like a case control study where you have two arms uh, for experimental design. One is where um, um, it's it's entirely sort of uh, iteratively model driven. So an active active design strategy and the other arm is more traditional. And you know, you clearly show for coding variants and non-coding variants uh, a few case studies where, you know, one arm uh, substantially outperforms the other on key endpoints, cost to discovery ratio, and uh, uh, also improvements in model performance. Right. So, so I think part of the problem is that it's very difficult to convince people that model-driven design is actually useful because no one's actually done the case control study. So. Uh -huh. you know, Nice to kind of have these a few pilots, which are literally case control studies. You know, two arms and do this. That's idea number one. Idea number two is, I think the biggest roadblock to actually reusing data is actually metadata. It's very easy to reprocess data and and consume it as a computational person if you knew exactly what the data represented. So again, putting some effort on how to ease uh, and how to make the process of of uh, reconstructing metadata or even providing metadata. Um, for data sets that are not produced by consortia uh, would go a really long way. I think that would be a good pilot project. Too. Okay. Andrew, did you still want to make a comment? Okay, Doug. And then quickly, Eric, I see you in the back. Just to quickly amplify that point, even if you're not using an AI, like even if AI is not going to save us from everything or you're not trying to apply a model, having the same metadata that Anshul just mentioned, it's the same thing that when I talk to my clinical colleagues and they're like, oh, I had to go read a paper to find out this variant measurement that happened or whatever it is, like it's the same, it's the same data that you're looking for, right? right. So important in all cases. Eric. Yes. So um, I, I guess I'm imagining a world in which we, uh, you know, we would have the sequencing data set and we have papers related to it. Maybe it's poorly annotated and we, we set the machine loose on these things and a machine that might have, have learned a whole lot about the structure of scientific research and the structure of these kind of data sets. Maybe it saw a lot of very useful kind of benchmark data that had metadata associated with it, but can fill in some of the gaps, or at least give like a semi-automated or, or automated way of getting us into that. And and the thing that like that that might be a few years away, but the thing that would be really helpful is ensuring that data resources at the NIH are kind of ready to be accessed mm -hmm. or or being provided in in ways that like dumps of data even that would be very easy for people to train these kind of models on. Okay. Um, and, that's one level. And another level would be to try to build groups that are attempting to do this in, in the open space, because it's really the open models that will be useful for research in the future. I just want to give one sort of explicit example, just really quickly. So like a, a very simple metadata term is like cell type, right? Or a bio sample. And, and uh, if you try to do this in, a, in the standardized way, you have to like link it to some cell ontology term, which is extremely painful. If you instead ask the end user who's providing this information, like entering this information geo, just enter some text, you know, like telling us what the sample's about. And then uh, the bot goes downstream and gives suggestions like, oh, which one of these terms do you think is actually reasonable? And then the end user just has to pick a term versus go search the cell ontology tree to figure out, you know, what ontology. So things like that are very simple. They could really make the process of annotating samples much simpler, starting off with just natural language text and then going off and finding standardized terminology and you making it more of a multiple choice question Q&A versus like, you know, go enter a thousand Excel sheets and figure out what happens. So like, there, there are samples that could be done that could really democratize this and make it much faster. Mm -hmm. Okay. Carolyn, should we go to another topic? Is your microphone... And this will be our last topic. It's the, the very big of the big, um, but I think time-wise, 
we only have time for one topic. So these are, I lumped together a whole, a number of different, what I'm going to call like large scale longitudinal study designs. So we have people who are talking about developing birth cohorts, um, getting involved in some of the biobanking, you know, maximize, figuring out how to better use existing biobank structures for rare disease study. Um, the diagnosed disease network idea that sort of got brought up a little bit yesterday. Um, and then, you know, funding an infrastructure to have deep studies and expanding the accessibility of information into some of these deep studies that are, and deep in this case means um, doing the multiomics and the phenotyping, et cetera, on these samples and having those data sites available. And then one other that I'll call out was, um, where did it go? Oh, so working within coordinated health systems and or coordinating together individual groups in different ways. So all of these, I'm gonna sort of say, have a common theme of really trying to think about how do we do large scale studies with longitudinal nature and a whole lot of data, but a coordinate in, in coordinated fashions with a focus on following the patients, not the, in people, not in models. So does anyone want to expand upon your post-it note in that sort of area? It sounds like there are a lot of post-it notes, so probably a lot of you. Andrea. I think one common theme there is being realistic with what actually exists within our U.S. healthcare system, which is the fact that most of the genetic testing is being done in commercial labs and how to leverage that information for what we want to accomplish. And that most of our genetic information around phenotype is in EHRs and how do we leverage that you know, when trying to think about this? Yeah. Sarah. I think another thing is, you know, coming, we we're talking about long reads, right? And we have 17,000 participants in our study of whom maybe a thousand have DNA of the quality appropriate for long read, right? So thinking about a way that just like there's a data sharing plan, what about all the bio samples? Maybe there's a reasonable plan for it to be kept with the investigator, but maybe the investigator's not going to have a minus 80 in five years. Mm -hmm. And so there is some sort of plan to have bio samples kept in certain, you know, you have your red blood cell pellet and you have your serum because if you're a proteomics person or if you're a, a genomics, you'll be interested in different portions of that sample. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and to have some sort of plan for those to go similarly with like, you know, standardized metadata that natural language processing can help you enter, uh, that there's a place where those can live because it's really the participants sample, right? And we should be doing the most with every sample to learn from, from um, the fact that they've enrolled in research. Yeah. Deanne. One of my post-its, one of my post-its was um, about building a kind of a core, a distributed Coriel for patient samples, you know, like having, have, cause you've got the genetic background and so, uh, and their variants. Mm -hmm. So have that available to investigators to do tests on that. So it might not, it would probably go to some central, uh, it could go to a central biobank that could be kept at that center and you have a distributed API that lets you go and figure out who's got these samples and you can request them. Mm -hmm. So that might be a way to solve that. I don't know. Other thoughts related to that sort of broad topic? Carolyn, are you sure that there are no other topics that we want to we, sure. we do have a few more minutes. So okay. I thought that was going to go longer. So I think the two other ones that somehow I split. <clears throat> Sorry, <laughs> I started and the sides of the board mean nothing anymore. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it has to do with with really talking about we talked about the um, engagement of the patient communities and then it's been touched on here, but I didn't call it out here. There was also the topic of clinical labs and infrastructure for um, data sharing of the clinical lab data, which just came up, but I, is is in there. And then um, just a broader one that Heidi had 
of just fun data sharing underlying underlying <laughs> with some other stuff around that. So I think I'll I, we can do those as two separate topics, or we can combine those together. I, I sort of had fun data sharing, and there's parts of that throughout everything we talked about, but it is its own post-it note as well. Heidi, go ahead. I mean, I was just trying to make the point that as you think about funding efforts to not just assume all the data sharing will happen in the individual researcher sites, because as Doug was pointing out, like they'll take the minimum approach. We really, I think, need to think about innovation in that space. And so it could either be funding groups that are focused on that task um, of data sharing and, and curation of data also, mm -hmm. um, and or thinking broader about the role of data coordination, you know, programs, you know, should they have a bigger mandate than just helping share the data being generated in that consortium? Should they have a larger mandate of interacting with sites around the world or right. other consortia and figure out how to aggregate large data sets? Like, you know, how do you think about the role of those opportunities within consortia and, and cross consortia, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I another question that I I kind of have is like how given the amount of data that does exist in all of these places that is difficult to be shared, if we could solve the problem of data sharing, imagine we could solve that problem. Do we have then the data that we need, or do we still need to have focused data generation efforts? And like, what is like sort of the key need for that? Does anyone have thoughts about, I see people nodding, but I don't know what you're, whether you're nodding. Yes, we need, like, I think that's a big question that we have too, is what do we, what do we focus on? Really solving the problem of getting the data available or so, focusing on solving the problem of generating the data. Sarah, do you have a? Uh, both, both. <laughs> I mean, right. I feel like there are people who are coming up with new tools to do like more than we could before with the same data. But then there's also people generating data in new ways that have come up with totally new questions. Mm -hmm. And so I don't feel like it's it obviously isn't a dichotomy uh, completely. But that um, it, it would be nice if every if every data set was maximally used, right? And so because of that, it seems like if the data have already been generated, they should be right. shared more, right? Right, And that that's something that's probably a lower proportion cost, in many cases, perhaps functional <laughs> high throughput studies aside, uh, that hopefully the cost of sharing already generated data is a small fraction of that to generate new data. When we're talking about maybe just BAMs and CRAMs for genomes and exomes. Right, like so, it, I think in certain sets or types of data, the the formats are standardized enough that that sharing should be a low bar. Mm -hmm. So I, um, I don't know. sorry, you're not on the 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 TV, so I can't see when you have your hand up. Oh, okay, sorry. Come back on the TV. <laughs> okay, there we go. Okay. Um. So yeah, I I fully agree. That data sharing is 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 a big bottleneck, and we should continue trying to solve it. But some of this also feels a bit like a social network issue, right? Like I mean, uh, there's one option which is data sharing broadly, and the other is also like handoffs. If you could figure out like who to who to reach out to, who has the data or the expertise to answer a specific question, uh, it would also be a way of solving the the problem without necessarily having figured out how to fig do all the data sharing. So mm -hmm. is there is there a way to use like, again, like, I don't know, follow a gene, fo follow a variant, I don't know, some social network ideas, you know, like where it's much easier to take a question and put it out into the ether and then find, find the right person with the right skill uh, or data or the tool to help answer it. I mean, that so I think- would be match A matchmaking thing, but very, very broad yeah, but 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 more broadly i mean I, I as a computational person like honestly like the whole rare disease stuff it's it really kicked in only when i 
talk to somebody like mm-hmm. who actually asked me a question that that was concrete uh, before that it was very hard to wrap your head around how you could help and right. once you do it once and then you figure out like oh i can actually do this many times it, there could be so many people out there in the scientific community who could help but and have the right tools but we're just not reaching them because everything is siloed and right. this, the social aspect of this really hasn't been explored okay ally yeah, yeah, I was going to suggest yesterday. You almost need like an eHarmony for for scientists. Does the eHarmony right? like, like this? I mean, you sign up. You have a profile. What you're what you're looking for in a match, yeah. and like your interest. And um, I think if it was part of a, a requirement when you're getting grants to 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 sign up for this and make yourself you know available, right? <laughs> that that maybe it would have some traction. But we could do it in a more focused way than you know. Today you look at websites, right? You kind of right. googled. Yeah, um, you know, maybe that's something that could be done. Eric, I, I had a note that was kind of related to this. It seems a bit random, maybe, but I, I suggested that uh, the people are encouraged to use uh, federated, open, um, real-time communication systems. Uh, there's one called Matrix.org. Uh, one of the reasons for this is that although it seems like we can all talk by Slack, you end up having to like add people to different servers in different ways, and not everyone has an account. Um, and so, you know, we all have email, but that gets overloaded. This uh, this kind of open federated model is a, is a way to have like a specific chat with just the specific people that you want in from all mm-hmm. kinds of institutions together. Um, and that, that's something that it could be encouraged in by funders because you, you all are paying for, you know, what well, we the public are paying for like Slack accounts on all kinds of servers that are not really communicating with each other very well. Right. Um, and it's just, it's not really necessary. So it's not, it's not means it's very low tech solution relative to what some of you all are talking about, but it would, it would, I think, help a lot to to encourage like spontaneous collaborations. That's it's been my experience. It helps a lot, at least. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're kind of like off in the wilderness doing on, um, on on the down low. But uh, that, that's something I really hope you all can look into as a as a way to encourage us to talk more. Okay. Okay. So I can I can whoops summarize us with a final walk through the the board. Um, so again, there was a number of recommendations that came out of thinking about connecting the basic science with a clinical lens. And that was kind of the, you know, this, the comment that was made yesterday was being on a ClinGen variant curation panel really helped me understand what types of things I should be doing. And, you know, how do we make some of that in that, um, you know, virtuous cycle, how do we bring some of that connection back into informing what we're doing in basic genomics? Then coming into standards and references and pushing forward and thinking about the existence of standards and references in this space um, and how that can be useful, not just for things that we're doing in the research community, but as ways to help engage and bring in the clinical lab and clinical lab data and also engage individuals with disease and patient communities and recognizing both of those groups as very important partners and players and stakeholders in this space. Um, We then had a number of recommendations around generation of specific types of multi-omics data, um, including that core question of how can we generate more multi-omics on a single sample and sort of moving to true multi-omics versus multi-omics being a bunch of different omics that are in different places and different things that you somehow then turn into multi-omics. And that requiring not just the data generation, but the software integrating that multi-omics analysis, which also in the context of this particular topic leads into how do we also then not just think about having our ohms, but having this idea of functional impact of variants and that functional information tied to specific variants or specific genes and both a comprehensive approach to generating that data and a comprehensive approach to thinking about how to find that information that's out there about particular variants or genes that people might be interested in. I messed up my numbering system. So then um, coming back then, then in the presence of having this multi-omics data, these standards and the software, 
how does that then move into some key recommendations about setting things up and capitalizing on things that can be done with prediction and machine learning. Um, as discussed at the end, a number of really cool ideas about large scale study designs of individual people that tend to have a focus on biobanking, longitudinal information, and the diagnosed disease network. And then a final recommendation that flows throughout, but could probably, it also can get called out on its own about advancing data sharing being a key theme that relates and unites a number of these ideas. So that's what I'm taking away from the board and the discussion as some of your key recommendations. Obviously there's a lot of detail that doesn't get done when you do a walkthrough like that, but that's a put it all together at the end summary. Great, thank you so much for that. That was really helpful. Um, okay, so I guess we're at the end of the day. So I just want to really thank you all for being here. We really take your feedback very seriously when we're thinking about developing uh, programs going forward, thinking about where our science needs to be going. Um, we talked earlier about sort of what is in the scope of NHGRI versus what is in the scope of other parts of the NIH. And I know that even if there are things that we talked about today that may fall outside of sort of where we are gonna be able to go, there are a lot of our colleagues at other institutes who either are watching this uh, now or will watch the recorded version too. And so I think that this, uh, that kind of feedback is really helpful more broadly. Um, if you think about things after this meeting, cause I know it's like a lot to think about in this course of a day and a half and you want to like, write some things down. You can put them in those Google Docs that we um, have in that drive. You can send me an email with some more detailed thoughts. All of that would be really appreciated. Um, otherwise, I really just want to, again, thank you all for being here. Thank my colleagues for helping moderate sessions, for wrangling post-it notes. Sarah, like we could not have done anything at this meeting without Sarah's help. Uh, so I really appreciate all that, Sandra, um, and the contracting company that helped us with the logistics of the meeting. And I hope you all have, uh, wait, oh, and Gerald, of course, we could not, the, the Zoom, coordinating the Zoom and getting all of the, the stuff going on here has been really helpful. Um, and I just hope that you all have a great trip back to wherever you're going. And thanks again for being here.